first of all, uh, uh, thanks for the invitation. So today I would like to talk about uh, uh, some uh, beautiful uh, themes and topics which uh, uh, raised uh, with uh, uh, a very simple model, which is the pre-critical easy model. So let me let me first of all start referring to a famous sentence by Richard Feynman in which he say, it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is, it doesn't matter how smart you are, if it doesn't fit with the experiment, it's wrong. So it's bringing us down really to, uh, to make physics, uh, to uh, physics to make contact with experiments. This was also the, the, the Fermi, how to say, approach to physics, and I'm going to stick to it, because uh, what happened recently is that uh, uh, there has been a stunning and actually delightful uh, uh, turning in the, in the subject of low dimensional system in which beautiful theoretical and experimental ideas that has been worked out for quantum integrable models have found a very nice and uh, convincing experimental realization and let's say confirmation. So, uh, Consider, for instance, uh, the two-dimensional is in model in a magnetic field. So this model uh, has revealed uh, an underlying uh, stunning E8 structures. And this is uh, the famous work by uh, Sasha Zamologic of, uh, in uh, 1989, where he proposed a scattering theory which uh, uh, capture the, mm, the beauty of this model, but in a very, very unusual way namely with the language of uh, elementary particle as matter scattering, uh, scattering experiments in quotation and scattering amplitudes. So this beautiful uh, uh, proposal of uh, uh, Sasha Zamologic of the scattering matrices, some years uh, later, have found uh, a more uh, detailed, uh, how to say, uh, screening and analysis because we, for, together with Gesualdo Delfino, we work it out exactly the matrix element of the magnetic field in the uh, theory proposed by Zamologikov. Now, this uh, uh, quantity, the, the so-called pond factor or uh, matrix element, on which I will uh, discuss more later, uh, allowed us then to have a direct confrontation with the experiments. Why so? Because then you can compute what is called the dynamical structure functions, which are the function which capture the scattering, the real scattering experiment with neutrons on one dimensional materials. And then this has been indeed realized recently in a series of experiments, especially in China. And let me show you the, 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 the outcome of this. So in the, in the above curve, the continuous curve is essentially the curve that you get using the form factor I computed with uh, Gesualdo Delfino to reconstruct this function. And the dot are the uh, experiments uh, carried out in this, in this group. So you see, this, uh, this uh, make really a very uh, close contact between theory and experiments and the uh, uh, corresponding output, uh, I would say, is rather satisfactory. Now, if possible, there is a class of universality even richer and more intriguing than the easy model. And this is uh, what I want, would like to convince you today. So this class of universality is the one of the three critical easy model. Why so? Because this model has uh, at the same time a lot of uh, beautiful structure in it. Yes, first of all, E7, which will, would be the corresponding, uh, the analogous of E8 for, for easing, has also supersymmetry, has also duality, has also parity, and so on and so forth. And moreover, this uh, model poses an interesting and new uh, engaging challenge from the experimental point of view a point on which I come back uh, uh, later. So what will be the topics of my seminar today? I will briefly describe the class of universality of the tricritical easy model, in particular uh, pointing out that this is spin one uh, model, and I will uh, remind the Bloom-Capel model 
which uh, parameterize this kind of physics. I will uh, uh, briefly uh, remind the conformal field theory and the deformations which are behind this model and uh, underline the supersymmetry and the E7 symmetry, which are, uh, um, which are inherent uh, this, this model. Then I will focus on the thermal deformation of this model. So the idea is uh, you are at a critical point and then you can use the relevant operator to go away from criticality. I'm gonna move the critical point just uh, moving the temperature. So this is the thermal deformation. And I can go either higher or lower with respect to the critical temperature. And we will see that these two phases of the model are related by duality. This deformation is what uh, uh, probes the uh, E7 structure of the model. And depending uh, whether you are low or high temperature, you have either kings or uh, ordinary particle. And I will uh, uh, discuss, I will point out, I will uh, compute their elastic S matrix. Then I'm going to use all this uh, scattering theory uh, exactly uh, close because he, he close a uh, uh, nest matrix bootstrap to proceed and computed the, the exact form factor and the dynamical structure factors, which are the quantity which allows us really to compare with the experiment. So this will be determined using bootstrap equation. And then there is also a very interesting theoretical problem that I will point it out when we arrive to this, uh, to this topic. So I was telling you that uh, the tricritical easing model with respect to the easing model, which is spin one half, uh, is uh, rather spin one. Now spin one, uh, of course, uh, is, uh, is also the, the zero, sorry. Uh, so this uh, uh, spin one admit as a states one, minus one and zero. Now zero can be interpreted as some kind of vacancy on the site where the spin is there. Now this uh, class of universality admit the realization in terms of one dimensional quantum chain. And here is, uh, is a, a, a representation of it. However, I'm gonna use uh, to uh, illustrate this class of universality a simpler uh, language, if you want, or a, an analogous language which is the, the language of two-dimensional classical statistical model. So in this language, uh, the bloom capel model, which capture uh, this, uh, this, uh, this kind of class universality is made as follows. You have variable SI, which take uh, values plus and minus one. These are the analogues of spin up and spin down. And then you have a variable TI, for the site i, which take values zero and one, which uh, telling us if the site is occupied, the value one, or unoccupied, if the value is zero. In terms of these variables, one can write down the most general Hamiltonian, which is local with respect to this variable and involve all, all of them. And uh, this Hamiltonian uh, has four parameters. So the green one are those coupling which are even under spin parity. The red one are those which are odd under the spin parity, where the spin, of course, is an odd, is an odd operator. One goes into minus one. So the model will be described in general by four uh, parameters, while I remind you that easing is on the other end described by two of them. Now the phase diagram of this model uh, uh, is obtained as follows. First of all, you put to zero the magnetic fields, both of them. And uh, sorry, I, I have to emphasize, yeah, that in this model, well, let, let me go in a little bit in detail in this coupling because this will be relevant later. There is uh, the coupling J, which played the role of uh, uh, T, T minus TC, which is like the easing, uh, coupling sigma i, sigma j. Here, the only difference is that is like easing if the two next neighbor sites are occupied. Then there is uh, a chemical vacancies for the uh, chemical uh, potential for the vacancies. So moving delta, you somehow fill or depleted the, the, the lattices. 
And then you have ordinary magnetic field, so the leading magnetization. But in this case, you have the possibility also to have a sub-leading magnetization field. So there are two odd coupling, leading and sub-leading magnetic field. So going to describe the phase diagram of triglitical is model one first put to zero the magnetic field, and then in the plane in which you have delta and j, what will happen is that there is a first order phase transition line, which meets a second order phase transition line. And by definition, the point which separated the first order from the second order is called trigritical easy model. Okay. Now, the two uh, regions uh, which are on the right or on the left are uh, identified as low temperature and high temperature phases. So moving away in this direction, we can arrive really to high temperature or low temperature phases. Interestingly enough, the second order phase transition line end up in the easing model. Now, there is many ways of uh, uh, getting this result. I'm going to mention one, uh, one of them now, and I'm going to come back to this point later in a more refined language, which uh, use uh, supersymmetry. So the, the easiest way to understand that the second order line end up, ends up in easy model is the following. Imagine that I start from the critical point and then I start moving uh, delta, the chemical potential, such that I feel more and more the lattice. But at the same time, I use temperature always to remain critical. So I feel more the lattice giving a correlation length, but then I put correlation length to infinity, just moving temperature. So at the end of the day, I'm realizing what is uh, known as a renormalization group flow. So a curve which involves J and delta such that the system is always critical. So at the end of, of, this, uh, uh, of this adjustment, what uh, we will have? We'll have the lattice completely filled because delta has become infinity, but the critical temperature is always there. And therefore, at this point, the model is nothing else than the easy model critical. So this is the easiest way to understand why the second order line starting from the triclitical point will end up to the easing model. Now we have learned in the last 30 years or so that the most elegant and effective way to understand the emergence of phase transition is the use of conformal field theory because uh, as Belavi Polygon Zamologikov told us, once you classify the critical point, a very good uh, way of exploring the space of quantum field theory is to add to the critical points all possible deformation and therefore seeing what is the instability of this critical point. So for instance, easing as two instability direction, which end up both in massive uh, massive phases at the end of the day, the triclitical easy model has four relevant directions. One of them we know is massless, while the other three in general will be massive. Now, to play the role of conformal field theory, you have to focus the attention on the uh, stress energy tensor, which uh, uh, close an operator product expansion with a parameter, which is C, which is a central charge, which uh, parameterize the various theory. Now the operator pro expansion, once you expand the uh, stress energy tensor in mode, become an infinite dimensional algebra. And interestingly enough, all the problem of classifying phase transition uh, reduce I ideally to find all possible irreducible representation of this algebra, which depend parametrically on the, uh, on the uh, parameter C. So C identifies the class of universality. So it's the first fingerprint of the class of universality you are talking about. And the operator content of that class of universality is sorted out once you ask the uh, eigenvalues of the operator L0, which play the role of dilatation operator. And the eigenvalues delta, which appear here, is nothing else than the anomalous dimension of that, that 
conformal dimension, then the anomalous dimension is the sum also with the anti-analytic part. And therefore, once you have classified all this, you have at your disposal, not only the operator content, but also how the fields interact. Indeed, if one does this, uh, uh, this exercise for the pre-critical leasing model, one uh, spot that the central charge of this model is seven tenth, and also spot all the anomalous dimension delta was mentioned before, and which organize, which are organized in the so-called cats table. So these numbers stay for all possible values delta, which are the eigenvalues of L zero for this model. Once you have this anomalous dimension, you can combine the left and right movers to really construct the physical fields. So the, if you combine in equal way, you get the scalar fields of the model. And the most relevant is sigma, which played the role of a, a magnetic operator. Then epsilon is the uh, conjugate the fields to the temperature. So it's the thermal operator. Sigma tilde is the subleading magnetization, and T play the role of the scaling limit of the vacancy density we met uh, in the uh, lattice realization of this model. Now, for the closure of the algebra, uh, you need also other fields and uh, like identity and epsilon. So, sorry. So uh, we have this identity and epsilon tilde, which is important to close the algebra, as I will discuss in a minute. But I want to point out that with this cut table, with these numbers, we can construct other very interesting operators, which are going to play a very important role uh, in, uh, in a meanwhile. The first is uh, the operator G, when I take three half as a left mover and zero as a right mover, and the conjugate where I take zero and three half. And moreover, I can construct a fermion. Fermion is each operator in which the difference between left and right movers is one half, in this case, or half integer. You see three five minus one ten is exactly one half, while one ten minus three five is minus one half. So the field obtaining combi combining left and right mover in this way is a fermion, and this is the, the conjugate one. Now, when you have uh, uh, this, when you have sorted out the operator content of a model, the next uh, question is what is uh, what what are their operator product expansion? So this can be worked out completely for this model. I skip here, I, I present just this operator pro expansion as skeleton form in the sense that each of these term, of course, uh, uh, get multiplied by the appropriate power, power law, which depend on the differences of the field, which take in account uh, the dimension, the right hand side with the left hand side. So this is very skeleton form. What is important is these numbers, which are, uh, perfectly tuned number, which make really the closure of the algebra. And if you want uh, the fact that uh, one can uh, have uh, the, uh, the four point function computed in equivalent way, either on the S channel or on the T channel. Now, what I want to remark is that, uh, look for instance here, you have uh, uh, the, the operator pro expansion epsilon epsilon, which goes produce T as well as T operated, uh, once you make an operator pro expansion with itself, also produce T. Now, in a generic theory, there is no reason whatsoever that this uh, uh, structure constant uh, should be the same. Actually, they are completely different in general. However, in this model, they are precise the same number. So this is the hint uh, that something is going on in this model, namely, epsilon somehow knows already on T and vice versa. So this is uh, the, the, the origin of uh, supersymmetric uh, uh, symmetry, the supersymmetry as I'm going to discuss in a minute. Actually supersymmetry help us also in uh, um, understanding better the origin of duality in this model. Now duality is in general, the fact that you have an order and disorder operators 
referring to low and uh, high temperature. So in, uh, uh, in high temperature, one usually has a disorder system. At the critical point, you have fluctuation on all possible scale. And on a disorder, I mean, at low temperature, typically you have uh, uh, the ground state breaking, the breaking of, uh, of symmetry of uh, the model. Namely, you have uh, the general ground state, the system choose one of them, but then you might have kinks which interpolate between the states. So. This duality was pointed out uh, first uh, by Kramer's uh, one year in 1941, and more recently has been uh, discussed in a very abstract term in a series of papers by Froelich uh, et al. What about this duality? Says that in the tricritical easing, each uh, order operator sigma is also accompanied by its dual disorder operator tau. They are not local one to the other. But these fields as equal conformal dimension. Now, as in the easy model, this property that sigma is accompanied by its dual operator tau and they have equal conformal dimension is a simple consequence of the presence of fermionic fields. Now, in easing are the Majorana free fields, in the three critical easy model are fermionic fields, although interacting, but the origin is always the same. So in order to understand- Can I ask a question about the previous please, slide? Please, please. The, um, can, you, can you go two slides back? Sure. Uh, one more uh, back. Uh, the ah, sorry. sorry. You mean here? Uh, yeah, so this, um, uh, th this you know you know because it's a minimal model. Yeah, right. so sure. I mean you can compute all these structural concepts because it's minimal models, and then at the end of the day you can sort it out all these numbers. Yeah. Good. And can you say again what um, what sigma prime is? Ah, sorry. I I, I think I, I I ah sigma prime. Sorry, I I call it sigma tilde before. Yeah, this might be the source of confusions. Okay, sorry, sorry for that. So, uh, so what is here? So sigma is the leading operator, okay? And sigma prime is the sub-leading operator. So it's what I call uh, in the previous slide sigma tilde, you see? is the operator which is made up by 716, while the sigma field is 380. Is it clear? What's the, what's the physical meaning of these different operators? Can you say well, the fact is, uh, you will see later when I will discuss the landau ginzburg uh, description, this class of universality, is the fact that uh, in this case, you have uh, as um, relevant fields, not only phi, let, let me call phi, uh, in, which will be mm -hmm. the landau but you can have also phi cube, normal order. Now, in easing, uh, phi cube, uh, it just, uh, by equation of motion, it's just d d bar of phi, so it's not a new field. Mm -hmm. See, because easing is phi to the fourth. I mean, I'm I'm saying roughly speaking, okay. So in phi to the fourth, the equation of motion is that d d bar of phi equal phi cube. So this means each time that you see phi cube in any correlation function, you are allowed to substitute with d d d d bar of phi. So uh, is not is not really a new field, but you will see later that this class universality on the other end is five to the six. So phi cube normal order is a genuine new odd order parameter. I have to keep into the game, so it's not uh, something uh, which is uh, how to say uh, byproduct of anything else. It's a genuine odd field. But so so there's phi and phi cube, which are like sigma and sigma tilde. Then epsilon is the energy. What's T? Yeah. T is phi fourth. Let me just write to Landau gives the description. Everything will become net and okay. clear. Thank you. So the story is uh, actually it's very beautiful uh, aspect of this story. With all the minimal models, one can play really one can uh, really play on two different tables and uh, and putting together you really enhance your knowledge because on one side you can work completely from conformal field theory point of view 
labeling the fields you like. Here I labeling sigma, epsilon, sigma tilde, t, whatever. Working out the structure constant, working out the correlation function, blah, blah, blah. But on the same time, you can adapt, you can uh, adopt, sorry, a landau ginsburg uh, uh, description, which involves normal order of the field. Normal order, however, obtain using the operator for expansion. So this was uh, another beautiful idea by uh, Sasha Zamologikov. And the two languages matches perfectly to, uh, to really uh, make reason of what's going on in the various class universality. Look, this will become, um, I hope, net and clear when I arrive to this description. Give me just a few minutes, I, I will be there, okay? Can I ask just a very quick question? Sure. Uh, is the Bloom Capel model actually self dual? Is it Cromer's? I mean, it's a lattice model, yeah. and it's really yeah. you can write down the yeah. dual of yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It is. It is. Yeah, indeed. So, is, uh, is uh, the, the, how to say, the duality of easy model uh, is uh, much well known, also due to Kadanov and Sheva. I mean, uh, there is, uh, I mean, the literature is very well explored and uh, I would say known. Less known is the tricritical easy model on the lattice, but essentially it's the same story. We can indeed work it out uh, an exact mapping between operator on one side and operator on the other side. Yeah, so the answer is yes, yeah. And just to make sure the Bloom-Capel model, its critical point is what will give you the tricritical Ising? Exactly, exactly, yeah. So, so I mean, I, I can go, I can go quickly, let me, in order since, uh, yeah. So you see, I mean, this is the, the, the Bloom-Capel model, okay, in full glory. Now, you want to know if this model is critical. Okay, first of all, you know that you have to kill all the magnetic field, otherwise you are never critical. Once you have done this, you ask in the plane of the two coupling delta and J, which are the Z2 even fields, will exist a point where the model is critical, namely where spin evagancies simultaneous as uh, fluctuation on all possible scales? And the answer is yes, okay? And, uh, and you will see how this uh, picture, which uh, will take some sometimes an ability to recover from the lattice point of view, actually become absolutely net and clear and elegant when you adopt when you adopt the field theory language. It will come absolutely straightforward. But from lattice point of view, I understand that um, is is a remarkable work to show that indeed there are a spatial value of delta and j which make criticality. Okay. Okay, so I was on the point uh, to say we uh, is dual in the sense. Imagine that someone has really worked out this Kramer's one duality for the critical easy model. But what I want to uh, reach now is an understanding. So I want to understand why in this model we should expect that sigma is accompanied by a dual disorder operator of the same conformal dimension. Now, my point is that my thesis, how to say, uh, what I want to underline is that as in easing, this property can be seen as a simple consequences of the presence of fermionic fields. And I said before, in easing, the fermionic fields are free, are free Majorana fermions. Here are non-free, they are interacting. Nevertheless, the origin is the same. So to see that, uh, we should bring into the game the field the G I was mentioning before, namely the field which is made by three half and zero, three half right movers, zero uh, left movers. Of course, there is a copy also in the, in the other way, zero and three half, but we focus only on one of them. Now, if uh, one works out the operator for expansion on this field, realize something remarkable that involve the same central charge of the model as before, but also the stress energy tensor. You see, the, the origin is very simple. This guy has dimension three. Therefore, if you subtract the dimension one from the pole, the operator which has to be here has to be dimension two. But in any theory, there is only one field, which is dimension two, which is the stress energy tensor. So this is the operator for expansion. When you go to the mode, here is the interesting story. Since these are fermionic fields, 
you can expand either in half uh, integers or in integer modes. Of course, this uh, is a commitment or the boundary condition you are giving to the fields, in this case, to, in the origin. But this is about, so what kind of uh, monotropy property are you assigned to the, to the fermionic fields? Now, once uh, you convert that operator pro expansion the usual way in a mode algebraic uh, uh, relations, you uh, find out that uh, you have super conformal algebra. So in addition to the Virasoro commutational relation of LN, which is the same as before, now we have anti-commutators, which involve L, the LN. So here, the problem is the same model not only support an irreducible representation of Virasoro, but is also support an irreducible representation of a Nantz symmetry, which is the one which involves also G. So at this point, you can ask, what are the irreducible representations of this uh, extended uh, superalgebra? Well, there are two of them. In supersymmetry, you have the so-called neveche vars uh, representation, which are local, and the Ramon representation, which are the non-local, non-local with respect to the fermions. So in the neveche vars, you can organize all the fields in the so-called superfields, alias to the usual bosonic coordinate z and z bar of the space, you add two fermionic coordinates, theta and theta bar. And since theta square is zero, you can develop what is on the left-hand side and the most, this is the expression you have on the right-hand side. So in the case of pre-critical easy model, the leading field can be identified as the energy operators. Then there are the fermions and the companion of the fermion, the other component of the fermion. The fermions, of course, is a two-dimensional object. And then as higher multiplet, as higher uh, fields of this multiplet, you have the vacancy operators. So this explains at once why the structure concept of epsilon and t from the point of view of Virasoro, namely, you don't know that there is this, uh, this, this, uh, this uh, uh, extra symmetry, you find out that the structure concept of these two fields were exactly the same. But now the explanation is simple. They belong to the same multiplet of supersymmetry and therefore being a unique representation, of course, they are forced to have the same structure, structure constant. Now for the Ramon sector, uh, you are interested especially in the zero mode of the field. Now the zero mode, the square of it is L0 minus C over 24, as you can easily see from the first line. So you have to ask yourself, in this model, does exist an anomalous dimension delta, which is the eigenvalues of L0, equal to C over 24? And the answer is no, there is no such operator. Therefore, G0 should have a representation which is a doublet. Namely, when G0 applied to an operator sigma, produce an operator tau. And when applied to tau, come back to sigma. So it has to be doublet, the representation of G0, and moreover, the same anomalous dimension for the rule of the algebra which are behind. Now, there are two Ramon fields, sigma, sigma, tau, and therefore, there are two doublets. So sigma is accompanied by tau, and sigma sigma tilde will be accompanied by tau tilde. So this is a very elegant way why this model should have a duality. Now this model, of course, has also some simple symmetries, simple and the same familiar symmetries, like the spin symmetry, sigma is odd, epsilon is even, and so on and so forth. And now we have also these grammars one year duality, which tell us sigma goes to tau, epsilon goes to minus epsilon, sigma tau, and so on and so forth. So now there are also some hidden symmetry. And now the story starts to become really interesting because this, the same model, pre is in model, despite its simplicity, support also extra algebraic structure, which is E7, 
supersymmetry we just discussed, and also an SU2. So let me briefly uh, tell you what about. Now, you know that the most uh, uh, universal way of constructing uh, conformal field theories, let's say, uh, really abstractly, like an industry, you want to construct a new and new uh, conformal field theory to, I don't know, to build up models or whatever, involve the so-called coset construction. The coset construction in a nutshell is the following. You take a group, you uh, build on it, on it the so-called Velsumino witten uh, model, which also has a rank in it, and then you start playing with group, uh, making a tensor product of it and factorizing with respect to some common structure. So for instance, if one does this uh, in involving SU2 and making SU2 a level four cross SU2 level one, coset SU2 level five, what remain out of this coset is precisely the pre-critical easy model with all the structure constant, all the operator response, blah, blah, blah. Amazingly enough, the same story happen if I take E7 at the level one, cross E7 level one, uh, coset E7 level two. And then supersymmetry is this other coset I was telling you about. So the pre-criticalism model admits really three different uh, uh, constructions. And amazingly enough, these are the three integrable deformation of the models. And depending which operator you use to deform the critical point, depending on that is the corresponding model will show up the corresponding symmetry. So if I use, uh, for instance, the, 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 the SU2 model, it will, uh, will be clear in a, in a minute. Uh, well, let's say E7, if I'm gonna use say the energy operator here, what will happen? is that I will become sensitive to the same structure of the model. If I'm going to use the, uh, the supersymmetry uh, vagancy operator, I will become evident to the supersymmetry uh, structure, which is underlined. So the, uh, the first uh, cosette construction refer, as a matter of fact, uh, correspond to the landau Ginsburg I was, uh, uh, I was uh, mentioning before. Landau mean, uh, Ginsburg means the following. You select uh, of the cuts table, the operator, which is the most relevant, which was sigma, and you call it uh, phi, okay? Now you use the operator for expansion of sigma, for instance, sigma, sigma produce identity that you will subtract in an operator for expansion procedure, plus epsilon. So epsilon from this point of view can be identified with normal order of phi squared. You keep using the operator for expansion to define sigma tilde, which will appear phi cube, and t, which will be phi four. So from this point of view, the tricritical easy model appear as the class of universality associated to landau Ginsburg, whose maximum power is phi to the six. And therefore, as, as we know from lattice realization, four different coupling constant associated to the four relevant operators of these models, okay? So G1 and G3 are odd, and G2 and G4 are even. And one can play with this very simple polynomial Lagrangian to understand broadly what class, what kind of phases you should expect in this model. So let me do this game, very simple. So imagine I start with this potential and I treat it really at the, at the, uh, at the three levels. So at the three levels, at the three levels, uh, I will uh, uh, I will just see what kind of landscape I'm going to have with these couplings. So imagine that uh, I switch on. So you see the rule of the game is five six. I never touch it. It's always there. And did the coupling course that I put to one. And then I'm going to switch one by one these couplings and see what kind of uh, landscape I'm going to produce. Now if I use G one. G1 will just shift the, 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 the vacuum somewhere to a non-zero expectation value. And I'm telling you, this is the only non-integrable deformation of the model. If I use G2, and uh, if G2 is positive, I'm gonna have a curvature in the origin and I expect particles. 
On the other hand, if G2 is negative, I'm going to have two degenerate vacua related by Z2 symmetry. And I, I should expect kings and bound state thereof. So this will correspond to the integrable in seven direction. So let me say on the last uh, column, I'm just telling you, I'm not proving, I'm just to give you the bookkeeping of, this, uh, of these uh, symmetries. Now, G3 is a very amazing deformation, this model, which will deserve a seminar on its own, which uh, will not be given here, because uh, this uh, uh, deformation produces a two degenerate vacua, however, asymmetric. So this means that uh, bound state of this theory, depending how you order kink and anti-kink. So let's say they will be a bound state if kink is followed by anti-kink, but not vice versa which is pretty remarkable situation. And finally, G4, depending if it's positive or negative, is the one which refer to supersymmetry. Indeed, G4 positive, there is no curvature in the origin, while G4 negative will produce a three degenerate ground state. So this deserves a comment. So when is uh, uh, massless, since this refer to supersymmetry means uh, that uh, uh, the supersymmetry is broken and the massless particle uh, referring to the break on supersymmetry are the Majorana fermions. Indeed, the Majorana fermions of easy model is nothing else than the relic of the breaking of supersymmetry of this three critical easy model. So if Ising was easy model wa was not uh, discovered by Ising himself, you should put uh, necessarily into the game because it's the model which come back from a spontaneous symmetry breaking. On the other hand, when uh, G4 is negative, you have three ground state, and this is uh, really the locus of uh, the uh, first order phase transition line. Can I ask a question? Sure. On the previous slide, it, I didn't understand the statement about the integrable. If you just take you take a two-dimensional scalar field, then we take phi squared plus phi to the sixth. That theory is not integrable, right? Well, I mean, you have to, uh, this we have to agree on one, uh, one uh, thing. There is, uh, how to say, we have to agree on a common ground, which is the following. The, the power of the field, phi squared, phi cube, and phi four are defined accordingly to conformal field theory, okay? So this is the point. I'm defined the normal ordering here, just using the, the operator pro expansion I show some slides ago. So you have not to taking literally uh, this landau Ginsburg as it is. You should not take it in literature because from this point of view also, phi to the fourth as landau Ginsburg is not integrable. But on the other hand, easy is integrable. So you should be careful in the way you are using this language. Landau Gisburg is a very effective way of having a bookkeeping of symmetry and phases. The detail, however, is not captured by Landau Gisburg. Then you have to refer to precise detail, which comes, say, from either conformal field theory or integrable technique. Okay, so this is uh, the understanding. I mean, if you take literally phi to the six with uh, phi square, it's not integrable. I agree with you. But this is not the way you have to mean, to, to mean this theory. It means that phi six deformed by G2 phi square, you ask what kind of landscape I should expect for the vacuum of this theory. Well, you can have either a unique vacuum or two vacuum, but related by Z2. And this model you put into the game or the artillery of integrable model as I'm going to do immediately after this, uh, this discussion, okay? So you have to keep uh, this kind of landscape I'm, I'm showing as a bookkeeping, somehow what you should expect to find. And then hopefully enough, the exact solution remind qualitatively the picture which emerged from this analysis, okay? So this is, uh, the way you have to understand the, the use and of Landau Ginsburg, but not literally. Uh, am I clear? I was clear enough. I think so, but uh, I, if I just have the Landau Ginsburg 
theory that d5 squared plus this potential, and I don't want to know anything else. Yeah. I, I guess I can't do much with that. Uh, I mean, you can do something, but obviously not uh, getting the exact solution of the model. But how would I, but I have, um, how would I see that it's integrable if you just wrote down? So I, I think your answer for why I, if I were to naively check if it's integral by just computing Feynman diagrams, I would get the wrong answers because you have some kind of normal ordering. Absolutely, for the is the point, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, the story, I mean, how I shall put, subtle is the Lord in the sense that uh, if you really use all the te uh, technique we learn on quantum field theory, which essentially Feynman diagram, at the end of the day, you are not able to discover this amazing uh, uh, structure of integrability, which is much more subtle and involve other, other things. The Feynman diagram essentially captures something of the model, but not, but not this, uh, this, uh, these subtleties. And at the end of the day, they refer really to a, to a different, uh, I mean, it's the same bookkeeping, the same symmetry is the same, the same number of operators is this and that, but uh, the, actual, uh, the actual way, so let me say, for instance, imagine that you take landau Ginsburg and you really compute the operator for expansion of phi with itself. You are never get, going to get uh, these amazing structural concepts. I want to show you what kind of numbers come out, just, just to, to make, look, the number is, look, gamma function square root two thirds, square root of gamma four, five. I mean, how the hell you are going to get this from landau Gisborne? Never, you see? So I want to say that conformal field theory is kind of magic uh, card game where you put all the card in the proper way that all the castle you have made is stand up alone. If you use the landau Gisborne, you know that phi phi is gonna be some phi square, but not at the level of this detail. So, I mean, we have to be really, how to say, we are a man of word. We can work with that. We can live with that. Okay. So the, the, the things that should not happen, how to say, is that you will find out from the exact solution that doesn't really correspond to the qualitative picture of landau -Gis. But At that point, you might start doubt what's going on. But unfortunately enough, this is what happened as a matter of fact. Okay, so summarizing, the first order line was the unbroken supersymmetry and there are three vacuum that generate. The broken supersymmetry is the one of the second order phase transition and the massless fermionic Majorana are indeed the Goldstino of this supersymmetry breaking and the E7 is the one which referred to low and high temperature. So I plot differently this, uh, this uh, story. So supersymmetry here, if I start negative, if I start moving the parameter, you see what's going to happen. The, the, the vacuum uh, uh, start to get, to get lifted. So you start having false vacuum decay. More I move, I arrive to a completely symmetric situation. Moving G4 and start flattening the, the vacuum. When I arrive G4 positive and G2 zero is completely flattened, so it's massless. When I start moving there, a new uh, vacua appears here, remain like this, and this is the situation. And uh, incredibly enough, the two pictures are related by duality. Okay, so whatever uh, you find in some language here on the plane, you should be able to rephrase it here in uh, the dual language. And then this is what happened. Let me also point out that you see is a very interesting theoretical problem to understand how the spectrum of this theory evolve when I start from this situation where there are kinks here, when there are decays of the vacua, two vacua, when I arrive here, when I arrive here, and so on, how the spectrum evolve moving the coupling constant. So this is an interesting problem, which I sorted out in a series of papers, which however, I'm not uh, have time to discuss here today in detail, because today I want to just concentrate on the E7 direction, namely the uh, field theory, which originated when I just switch on G2 alone. 
So I can have high temperature where there are uh, unique vacuum and excitation above it, or I can have low temperature where I have two vacua, kinks and excitation above that. And this is indeed the E7, the E7 phases of the model. And uh, the story is like this, at the criticality, the model is built up in with the so-called massless Toda field theory, which is a generalization Liouville, which involved the simple roots of E7 uh, algebra. When you add the, the uh, thermal deformation, you are adding uh, to this Dinkin diagram, the so-called maximum root, which is a unique root, which complete the Feynman diagram. Now, in general, adding this uh, higher uh, uh, root make the diagram more symmetric. It indeed, you see immediately that the, the, the diagram has acquired an automorphism, which is Z2, has become Z2 uh, even. So the inclusion of this extra, extra root make the theory massive. And then you end up in some kind of total field theory massive. Moreover, you can prove that is integrable, this, uh, this, uh, this theory. Now, this, uh, uh, this has been worked out uh, years ago together with Philip Christe. This means that when I add this thermal deformation, the model has uh, a series of conserved quantity where uh, the spin of this uh, uh, quantity is a very, very specific pattern. You see that pairwise, so one and 17, five and 13, seven and 11, nine with nine, always make a sum 18. Now, when you have a set of numbers like this, they are indeed some Coxeter exponents. In this case, the Coxeter exponents of E7. The way of checking integrability involve a very uh, nice technique of conformal field theory, which I'm not going to discuss here. So you can assess the integrability just using uh, the data from conformal field theory. Now, at this point, something uh, interesting happened because looking the pattern of conservation law, one realized that they are completely compatible with the following dynamics. So you can make the hypothesis that this model has a fundamental particle A1 and the presence of these conserved quantities implies that there might be some extra states, which I call A2 and A4. And moreover, I can compute the mass ratio of this. So this follow uniquely from the fact that I'm implying conservation law here at this stage of the diagram and here, okay? So once uh, you have this uh, new knowledge that uh, the theory might have not only a fundamental particle but also bound state with this specific uh, mass ratio, you can put really a very educated guess on the form of the exactest matrix of the model which is this, and the pole of this S matrix refer to these bound states. At this point, you have the, uh, conform, the, the S matrix bootstrap to compute all the remaining amplitude. I remind you that bootstrap, uh, the bootstrap principle says that all particles are equal, but one, one is more equal than the other. Na namely, you start from this A1 theory, you create uh, an amplitude the way I did it. And then you enforce that if you want to compute the S matrix of the bound state, you just uh, say that the S matrix of the bound state, which is here, has to be computed in terms of product or the S matrix of the asymptotic particle in a very specific way, which is some shifted in the, in the rapidities. So once one does this, uh, this kind of stuff, uh, the bootstrap close with 28 amplitudes, which at the end of the day refer to seven bound states. And this amplitude satisfy unitary then crossing in the, in the usual sense of the word, which here is uh, this set of uh, uh, functional equation for this amplitude. So from the bound state, one has the pole structure and can extract exactly the uh, three coupling constant and moreover, all the mass spectrum. 
How do you see that there's seven bound states? Yeah, I, the story is articulated. So what you have to do, and this is how uh, we compute the first time with Philip Christ many years ago. So the rule uh, is uh, the following. You start uh, from an amplitude, okay? This is at the level of answers. At this point, this amplitude has some poles. At this point, you promote the poles to be bound state and you put in a basket of bound states. At this point, you use this bootstrap equation here to construct the amplitude of the new bound state. Imagine I want to construct the amplitude of the particle I call two. I can do it. And then I realize there are new extra poles. At this point, you promote the pole to be the signal, a new particle you put in the basket. And you keep moving in this kind of, uh, of bootstrap. You don't know if it's gonna close. It's just a, a, a game, a bet. But once you are able to identify the, uh, the particle according to this formula, so this is the crucial formula. When you have a, a pole, you can compute what is the value or demand of some variable on the pole. And this uh, uh, involve imaginary value of the rapidities. So you have this formula, which is nothing else than the Carnot formula for a triangle, okay? So the rule of the game is once I know what are the asymptotic particle A and B, knowing the, where the, bound, the, the pole is, I can compute the bound states and the mass of the bound states. So at this point can happen two things. Either I already identified this particle, it was already in, my, in the basket or the bound state, or is a new particle. So if it's in the basket or bound state, uh, very well, I, I, I don't care. But if it's a new particle, I have to put it into the game and continue the bootstrap equations. So it's kind of remarkable that uh, iterating this equation in blindly, so you don't know it a priori, after a certain number of iteration, all the poles you are going to obtain correspond to the bound state that you already have in your basket. At this point, you close the story. Uh, and you count how many amplitudes you have. And in this case, it's 28. Is it clear? Yes. Is this related when you were listing the, the conserved currents? You also had some num num Is that related? Um, you had some numbers for which currents were conserved. It was mod some other number. Is that related to the seven? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, of course, I mean, after, uh, after thought, uh, everything matched together, depending uh, how much insight, how much, how uh, to say, intuition you have. Of course, uh, if one uh, at this level already recognized that there are cops that respond to V7, well, you smell that at the end of the day should be seven particles. Okay, so this is this is the this is the this is the this is the point that uh, once uh, you have identified that is the Cox response of seven, you should expect seven particles. But imagine that you don't ever recognize this E seven. You might play the role I've just told you, namely you use this conserved quantity to fix some mass ratio. From this, you fix an S matrix. From this you go ahead with the, with the bootstrap equations with the idea that each time that you met a new particle through the new poles that you find, you put into the game this new particle. Otherwise, you, 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 I mean, you already had there. And then you see up to which point the amplitude you are computing uh, close or not. And as I say, in this case, close with 28 amplitude referring to the possible seven scattering of this particle. So in particular, this will be the exact mass ratio on these models. Perfectly computed is, uh, is an algebraic numbers corresponding also to the, to the, to the, to the root of the seven. One can put in correspondence one to one. Uh, at this point, one realized that in this model, four particles are below threshold and three are above threshold in the continuum, which are stable just for the integrability of the model. And if you are curious about the structure of the bound state, one can uh, uh, plot it in this way. Here, what I'm, what I'm using is, if I go for instance, A2 and A5, in this scattering channel, I know that I'm going to have four poles which identify with the particle two, four, and seven. 
clear? So if I go to the scattering channel three with five, I will have two poles which can be identified with the particle one and six and so on and so forth. Can I ask a question but, about the particles in the bound states? Um, I mean, in some models like uh, sine Gordon, you can have the fundamental particle basically disappear and still keep the balance state. So for example, the kinks can disappear, but you'll still have breathers. It's true, yeah. Yeah, do you have anything, analog can something analogous happen here? Not Where here, not here. here. Okay. So, the, not so here. the mass ratios are always fixed. Yeah, 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 not, not here. I, I mean, here, there is no coupling constant I can use it. It's rigidly fixed, everything. In sign order, you were referring, you have the coupling constant can, can, that can be moved. And then uh, it might, I mean, the spectrum change when you change the coupling constant, something happened where, for instance, the kings are no longer attractive, but the interaction between kings are no longer attractive and so on and so forth. Here is everything, there is no coupling constant essentially. Okay, because I'm just, uh, you will see in a minute what, uh, what is the, the story. So the story is, okay, let me uh, keep going. I'm, I'm gonna comment in a minute what, what this. So in high temperature, I should expect to have one vacuum and seven particles above it. In low temperature, I should expect kinks and bound states. So which is which? So this is the table. Namely, whatever is odd particle, remember I can assign a parity here, will become kink in low temperature. And whatever is even, remain particle in both, in both part of the, of the diagram. So this is uh, the, the, the bookkeeping. All the odd particles become kinks of bound state in the low temperature. Now, you might say, look, beautiful theory, beautiful set of ideas, but this might be completely dream might be completely unrelated to the to the model you are talking about how do you know that correspond to it well there is a very efficient numerical method to check that everything has been done is correct so the method goes under the name of truncated conformal space approach and is due to Yurov and Zamologov that propose it so the story is I can associate on a finite geometry of radius R, so cylinder, the Hamiltonian corresponding to my deformation, where I have conformal field theory H0, and then I move the, I mean, I couple to the operator I'm, I'm, I'm deforming with. The nice thing is I can compute the matrix element of this Hamiltonian exactly using the conformal basis. I'm stressing conformal basis, not the basis of scattering. So the conformal part is a purely diagonal matrices, which involve the anomalous dimension, while the deformation involves the structure constant of the models, okay? So at this point, I can uh, make in the numerical representation, this Hamiltonian large as much as I like, at least uh, as much as uh, computer resource I have, and then numerically diagonalize this Hamiltonian and see what's going on. Why? Well, because depend also the boundary condition I'm going to use on this theory, because I can put uh, periodic boundary condition on anti-periodic. And we know that kinks can only exist if I have anti-periodic or twisted boundary condition. If I have periodic boundary condition, kink will appear only as a result of kink anti kink bound state. Now, what is the general uh, uh, behavior of the eigenvalue I should expect uh, in this uh, setting? Well, depend how much R compare with the correlation length created once I couple the conformal theory to these external fields. If R is much less than C, I should expect to find a behavior one over R. But if R is much larger than C, I should expect to find a linear behavior of the energy with the mass gap, just identify how far they differ from the ground state. So that being said, this is the general uh, things you should expect for the ground state, for the energy of the model. If I plotted the differences in this case, 
for low for high temperature when i put uh, lambda positive this is the spectrum i got look look how it looks like so definitely i have a mass gap one another line unique line that is 1.28 a third one 1.87 1.96 this is done with periodic boundary condition in high temperature look what happened if i switch the sign of the coupling and go to low temperature all the odd line smash to the even one see this smash to the even one exponentially and this is just the tunneling between the two backward and with periodic boundary condition exists only the spectrum of the even particle so say differently if i do this kind of analysis i confirm straightforwardly the result coming from the s matrix theory i developed before not only but also the nature of the excitations and on top of that let me also comment here when you do this hamiltonian lambda is uh, in a, an anomalous way a, a, a measure of the mass gap of the theory so if i put the mass gap to be one as i did here there is no coupling constant so this is the difference with this with respect to the sine gordon this theory has no coupling constant essentially so the lambda the coupling constant play the role of how you are measuring the mass gap and if i normalize to one is a choice at this point there is really no coupling constant to play with okay so this is the reason why this model is completely different from the sine gordon model which is another of course beautiful integrable model okay so all what i told you provide the exact solution of the tricritical easing model if i use thermal deformation now i can use mass the that i know the mass gap i know all the masses of this particle i can use that i know all this matrix and residue the pole and this and that to reconstruct the correlators of the theory because i use the uh, lehman uh, the spectral representation of the correlation function inserting a complete set of states which are the particle and using all the property of uh, translation uh, uh, rotation and this and that and uh, Lorentz invariance to represent my correlators in terms of matrix element on the excitation of my theory okay now you might say well this is exact but at the end of the day it might be not very effective because at the end this correlator is expressed in terms of an infinite sum is it true however years ago together with john cardi we show that this kind of spectral sum is in general very fast convergent this means that you can have you can uh, employ very few form factor depending uh, how much accuracy you want to reach by really you saturated the, the value of the correlation function the origin of this convergence is two folds first of all that the uh, phase space in two dimensions shrinks in high energy rather than enlarge and the second thing is that uh, this matrix element start to have zeros of higher and higher and higher order which essentially make in fourier transform this correlator as smooth as you can imagine so the result of these two effect make this sum extremely convergent and extremely fast convergent and then make effective so this is uh, at the end of the day the 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 story the status of art so the correlator can be represented as a sum on the intermediate states but as i said you employ the, the the ones you you like to to reach the accuracy you need so if you make Fourier transform, you can have the so-called dynamical structure factor. And this indeed depends on this matrix element. So let me spend a few times how to compute this matrix element. All of what I'm describing you is in a paper I wrote recently with uh, Axel Cortez Cubero, Robert Konick, Lanches, and Gabor Tagas. So matrix element of this matrix element uh, say on uh, in states now this matrix element that you can uh, show graphically like this 
satisfy what I call a masochistic equation. Masochistic because you start with something simple like this in, but then you use a, a basis, which is the out states. And at this point, you see that this matrix element is expressed as an infinite sum of other matrix element. So this really looks like masochistic exercise. You might wonder what is the uh, what is the the utility of this? Well, the utility is uh, since uh, the matrix element out in is the S matrix. When you have an integrable model, the S matrix is uh, elastic, so you cannot produce particle. And so in this case, the equations refer to the value of the function on in some set of uh, in uh, momenta to the values of function which are out. And you know what is the, 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 the discontinuity, let's say, of this. So shortly uh, put it in this way, the Watson equation reduced to a Riemann-Hilbert problem. Anyway, you have to find a function where you know the value above and uh, below a cut, and then you know what is the discontinuity. And this case can be solved. So uh, each time that you uh, braid two particles, you have an S matrix. Each time that you make it around, around the other, you have just the reordering of the particles. And moreover, this uh, matrix element satisfy a set of recursive equations in which uh, matrix element of n particle is, for instance, related to the matrix element of n minus two particles, as, uh, for instance, in these cases, one can uh, write down the residue equation for this, keeping uh, uh, account of all the kinematic. Remember that the rapidity parameterize energy like cosh beta and uh, uh, momentum as sinh beta. So if you put the momentum to i pi, you're just reversing the sign. So you're going really kind of head to head uh, scattering like this, like one particle is scattering with another one is annihilating. And this can be related to the others and notice in this case, appear also no local index because if I shift uh, these two lines in, depending what is the locality property or the excitations, this line with respect to the operator. Okay, so you have to keep in account this. Now, uh, you can have also a bound state uh, recursive equation where you take two of these particles and you go on a kinematic situation where they produce a bound state and you know exactly the residue because this is the S matrix that told you what is gamma and you write down this kind of recursive equation which allow you to go from N to N minus one. Now, let me make a very important observation. All the equation I've been uh, talking so far monodromy, duality, I mean, duality in the sense of uh, uh, the T-channel and this and that, re recursive equation and this and that, never refer to any operator, never. It's completely general. So this means something very, very important that the operator content of a model should emerge just finding all possible different solutions on these, these equations. So as in conformal field theory, we identify the operator just by reducing the representation of the Virasoro algebra. Using the form factor approach, you should be able to identify the different operators just by the different solutions of these equations. And this indeed is what happens. So for the tricritical easy model, if one solves this equation, find two Z2 odd local solutions, which correspond to the order parameters as well as one find two different, even non-local solutions, which correspond to the disorder parameters. And two Z2 even local solutions, which correspond to the energy and vagancy operator. So amazingly enough, the form factor reconstruct precisely the operator content of the theory, the way we like, we, we, the way we know it. How we are sure that we are talking precisely of these operators, well, one can employ the form factor in certain sum rules 
which is, for instance, these sum rules. So if you compute this, the result is the anomalous dimension of the fields you are talking about. And so knowing the matrix element of the uh, theta, which is the stress energy tensor, the trace, and knowing the uh, form factor of the supposed operator phi, you just insert in this sum rule, and you see what kind of delta you get. And then you say, ah, this solution corresponds to the uh, energy operator. This solution corresponds to the vacancy operator, and so on and so forth. Now, if I want to compare with experiment that is a subtleties, the subtleties uh, on the lattice, uh, I have certain variable, but in the field, uh, quantum field theory, I have other variables. So on the lattice, any odd operator will be uh, given by linear combination of the two odd scaling fields I have on the continuum plus irrelevant operators. So I have A and B, two constants which enter into the game, which depend on which kind of lattice I'm, I'm using. So these are, how to say, uh, something which is not universal, depend on the lattice realization. However, when I compute the two point functions of this and I develop all the algebra, you see that this experimental correlator will depend on the theoretical one, which I can compute through the form factor with this uh, algebra A square, B square, and two A and B. Now, the fact is I have to fix A and B many, many poles. Remember, I have many poles on my, on my uh, S matrix. So it's enough uh, to make two resonance pole and two matches, which is what is on the left-hand side with the right-hand side, that I can fix A and B. Once I use two poles, all the rest is uniquely fixed and therefore become predictive, the story. So to make uh, the comparison with the uh, experiments, I need to compute this uh, function exactly from, uh, from the field theoretical point of view. So in the high temperature, I will have the order parameters. So this will be the function that uh, I shall consider. In the low temperature, I can consider the one of the disorder operators. And of course, the two pictures uh, will provide the, the, entire, the, entire, uh, the entire phase uh, diagram, how to say the entire behavior of the theory, depending where, where I am. Now, I told you that uh, uh, there are fast convergence of this series. So in the calculation we did, we arrive up to these states. So we include A2, a part A1, A2, A4, A1, A1, and so on and so forth, up to this, to this uh, sum. And I want to point out that the spectroscopy you should expect from E7 is very, very rich because with seven particles, you have many thresholds here you should expect some really peak, some delta function peak. Here you should expect some, uh, some uh, branch cut and so on and so forth. So very uh, rich E7 spectroscopy is expected for this calculation. So let me show you the result. So for the one parameter, uh, for the order parameters in high temperature, one can compute uh, this, uh, the one particle contributions for sigma and for sigma prime. And these values are, uh, are unique in the sense that theory predict uniquely the peak of these functions, which are shown here, okay? These are the theoretical predicted without any extra parameters of fit or whatever. These are exact result. And then I can use also all the form factor contribution to compute also the two particle ones. And so these are, the result expected for this kind of functions. We fold the threshold relative to one, two, one, four, two, three, one, five, three, four, and so forth. Now, the same story can be repeated also for low temperature. So one can include the one particle contributor, contributions. Once again, these are completely exact numbers which come from the closure of this uh, equation and also the two particle contributors computed in the way I told you. So at the end of the day, this is what is expected. 
So overall perspective uh, challenge and conclusion. So physics of spin one display a very interesting web of remarkable symmetries like E7, supersymmetry, duality and so on. Today I concentrate just on E7, but the same game can be also made on supersymmetry and one can also use integrability to explore the breaking of integrability if you move, remember, in the plane I was showing before. The critical easy model is an ideal play playground for this physics, and in my opinion, is really a theoretical gem in itself, because there's a lot, a lot of ideas represented in a very vivid way and in a very computable way. So quantum integrability, all the symmetry I described before, bound states, uh, and so on and so forth. Let me point out the self-duality of this model from a field theoretical point of view, just related to the presence of uh, uh, fermions and their zero modes. There is uh, really a detailed study of E7, which uh, induce uh, all this kind of uh, uh, information that can be checked a, a priori in, uh, in experiments. This indeed can be used to compute exactly the structure function and the rich spectroscopy. And uh, I would say it would be extremely fascinating if someone would be able to realize such class of universality experimentally and indeed check that what had been computed is indeed realized or not. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Are there any more questions? This is very nice. Um, can I ask, um, do you actually have all the form factors to all, essentially all the, for, for an arbitrary number of particle states and, and the- uh, No, I'll, well, the answer is no, but for the reason I explained before, because uh, to make, say, to, to, to make such curve, let me just, uh, so I imagine that uh, you want to, to make really this curve and this when it jump and so on so forth, these kind of things. If I include uh, say that 24 uh, intermediate particle will not change anything. I see, okay. So you don't really need them. So you only have no. uh, two particle form factors then for, for some of these operators. Yeah, indeed. I, for this point of view, for all this calculation, and of course one can check. Or the, the, let me see. Sorry, I, I, I went down too fast. Sorry, give me. Yeah, these are the states we employed. Okay. So, for what are the odd states, which of course. Uh, sigma is involved, we arrive up to energy, if you want, 3.84, okay? For the other one, which is even, we arrive up to essentially the same energy, 3.87. This is controllable though, namely, if you want, if you uh, check what happened, if I say I include here uh, states 4.4, four, well, at the end of the day, it's negligible, completely negligible. Because more you go, uh, higher you go in the energy, lower the contribution is. Yeah. For the for the uh, conspiracy of the two effects I was describing, namely the phase space shrink at high energy, so will not increase, shrinks. Okay. And moreover, the uh, form factor you are putting in the spectral representation is zero, which makes the function really flatten. So I imagine you have a, a function which is going, it's growing you add a new term, which is completely flattened. And so will not change anything, even if you add this extra term, because it's really much, much flattened. And so yeah, it goes right. really to very few percent, if you want. Okay. Yeah, you really don't need to have the exact correlation function. You only need uh, the leading terms of the form factor expansion. Well, let's say that also from an experimental point of view, you have uh, resolutions, right? You cannot go lower than certain values of the energy. So at this point, uh, what is, uh, why one should uh, struggle theoretically to have uh, all the form factor uh, that, that are invisible experimentally? I mean, I can understand theoretically is a challenge, 
can be done, eh? can be done. Just question of be patient, right. nothing else. Let me, ask can be done. Let, let me ask you a related question. If you look at the spin field, um, the uh, essentially the spin density or the scaling field, whatever we, we want to call it, uh, presumably if you go to the, to the ordinary icing limit, your form factors should just become a tanch of a difference of rapidities. Uh, can, can you get to that limit and see see that that happens? Uh, no. That from your critical point. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. No, question. yeah, sure. The, 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 the question is pretty relevant. However, you cannot see for the calculation being done. Let me show you, let me tell you why. So I, I probably have to, to spot the, the curve so I can talk immediately. Uh, here. Right. If the point's too far away for the ordinary icing model. I oh, guess. So the point is, uh, what you are asking is, uh, imagine I have here some object, which I call spin spin. Okay. Yeah. And then I carry on what, how this quantity change if I move here. But not only that, when I arrive here, I should split it. Yeah. You agree, right? Because mm -hmm. this is, will be the thermal deformation. Now, on the other end, I'm computing the form factor in the E7 theory. So if I want to do your game, if you want, uh, if I want to find answer to your questions, I should do something completely different, which however, uh, involve, first of all, massless form factor here. And secondly, mm -hmm. when I arrive here, making massive in this other way. Now, theoretically, has to be possible because it's uh, precisely what I described. However, technically, it's not so easy. I've been computing in the past exactly the massless form factor along this way. Yeah. And what happened is indeed, you find what in uh, uh, modern language become TT bar deformation on this easy model. And indeed, you find a full correspondence of the operator content here with the easy model. So you know what is uh, sigma of the tricritical becomes sigma of the easy model. But T, the vacancy operator here, becomes TT bar here. You see? So there is a, a mapping, a vocabulary, which tell us which is which, is which and whom is going to in uh, what other fields. And this, you can use the form factor to do that. However, uh, to answer really your question, to see whether the sigma sigma correlation function at certain point is expressed as a product of tangent, as is in the easy model, uh, this looks to me really, uh, I mean, uh, quite complicated game to, to do because the form factor calculation depends on this matrix underlying. And to do what you want to do, you have to have a massless as matrix here, then minus one here. So you have to follow the evolution of these uh, things. And even though in principle it's possible, technically become rather impossible. Right, right. So. This going from the Ising to the trichorical Ising, it's not just a TT bar deformation. That's just, you have to deform by a bunch of terms. TT bar is just the first, right? Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely, yeah. Because t I, so, 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 okay, let me be more specific. If I want to get to the easy model from the tricritical easy model point of view, I have to use a relevant operator, which is the uh, which is the vacancy operator, which unfortunately is called t, little t, little t. So if I use this with plus sign, I'm gonna reach the easy model. But you can take the point of view, say, okay, I'm sitting in an easy model. I see something coming up from somewhere. From the easy model point of view, how can I describe this renormalization group trajectory? And then you find out that it is a irrelevant deformation of easy model through the direction TT bar, which indeed preserve this, this duality, okay? But since is irrelevant, if you want to make fully sense of the theory from easy model point of view, you should add an infinite bunch of other irrelevant operators, which in this case can be fixed thanks to integrability of this flow. Otherwise become completely uh, a theory which is not predictive at all. You see, yeah. the point, 
when you deform by relevant operator, you start having no renormalizable theory. And if you should fix at any order new couplings, the theory might become meaningful, but unpredictive. In this case, is not only meaningful, but also predictive because it's integrability what to save the day. And Giuseppe, could uh, yeah. you say more about this king particle duality? Do I, do I understand it, it correctly that in both in low T and high T phases, the Beth Ansatz equations are the same but the, um, there is a, you, the form factors of the same operators are different, like, like in the Eisen model, for, for example. The... Uh, yes, in the sense that, uh, you know, also in easing, uh, uh, kink uh, in easing, uh, assume, uh, I mean, um, looks like a particle as well. The only thing uh, is that you give an interpretation of uh, topological excitations, okay? Mm -hmm. So here, if you write down all the bootstrap equation for the S matrix, all the beta answers equation like this, are exactly the same. The only thing is that uh, you say, ah, but which phases I am? Let's say ah, high temperature. Well, high temperature should be, expect all the particle to be, all the excitation to be local particle. And I say, yeah, indeed, is what I saw, what I see. But when you go to low temperature, you say, well, Ooh, where are the key? Uh, how do you distinguish lo local from no, 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 no local in the, in the bootstrap equations? And the point is uh, this one, I, I have to, uh, this, I mean, the answer is, is a, a little technical, but not so much complicated. Is here, the story is here. When I write uh, uh, recursive equation for the form factors and refer to particles, so imagine that I want to find the, the form factor of the disorder operator. Yeah. Well, I'm forced to use a recursive equation which involves this, ah, this okay. Okay. and this change the equation, change. Because yeah. if gamma is one half, this becomes plus. Yeah. Okay. On the other end, if gamma is zero, you have one minus. And so you're yeah. looking local. So okay. this is where, uh, this is the fingerprint where local, no local solution and operator particle enters. Mm -hmm. This is okay. precisely the key point. Okay. So the, this index, in, in index gamma, gamma changes. Uh, I believe it, it will interchange between odd and even when you when you go from one phase to another, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. Okay. okay. Yeah, indeed, indeed. What we did is first we solve a set of equations, say with gamma zero, and mm -hmm. we find how many solutions we had, and we find two. Then two different, of course, two two different chain of solution, of course, because there are infinite uh, family of form factors. Then we put gamma is equal one half. And we find other two solutions. Mm -hmm. And this were, this were indeed the, the, the things I say here. When we yeah. find local, namely we put gamma equal zero, we find two Z2 odd that we identify with sigma sigma tilde using the delta sum rule. When we put gamma is equal one half, we find uh, two solutions and we mm -hmm. were able to show that delta was the same. <laughs> so, and this uh, really matches with what I saw, uh, with what I told at the very beginning that gamma, sigma, and mu should have the same dimension, blah, blah, blah. That one is even, one is uh, odd. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you. Yeah. Any more questions, comments? Okay.
then we'll resume at uh, 11 in 20 minutes with Guru's talk. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, bye-bye.